morning, everyone. Um, before Lisa um, starts off, kicks off, just wanted to let everyone know that we will be sharing the slides and a recording of the presentation um, at some point next week. Um, we will not be uh, sharing the discussion section of the event, which will be the second part of the event. So just so that you're aware, um, feel free to speak freely. Um, and we will be recording that discussion just for our own note taking purposes, but we won't be distributing the, the discussion recording um, generally. Um, to the public, but the presentation will be recorded and presented and actually posted on, on YouTube as well, so you can share it around. And I think uh, I'd like Lisa kick us off. Okay, great. Thanks, Ryan. So welcome, everybody. This is our fourth uh, stakeholder engagement workshop um, for government representatives and regulators, uh, but I'm sure we probably have a variety of folks on the call. And um, we've got about 50 joined in already, and I, I think we're expecting um, quite a few more. So we'll, we'll just get started and they can join in as they can. This is a partnership project between City of Toronto, the Atmospheric Fund, Mantle Developments, uh, Passive Buildings Canada, Builders for Climate Action, and the University of Toronto. Um, so here's our agenda for the day. Uh, so we're gonna have you involved until about 12.45. Hopefully you're able to stay for the full time. So we're going to start off with some context on what we're trying to do um, and giving you some basics around embodied emissions and materials, things that you need to know and understand, and then talk about um, two really important studies underway. Well, three really, including the deficit rating to how we develop policy going forward um, at the City of Toronto. I know my, my internet connection is a little unstable today, so I apologize for that. We'll just kind of do our best. Uh, next slide, Ryan. So we have... Um, Four speakers, five actually, we have a surprise pop-up guest for you a little later, but um, I'm Lisa King, I'm with the City of Toronto City Planning Division, and I lead the Toronto Green Standard, and Ryan Zizzo, he's with Mantle Developments, um, CEO and founder, and uh, we have Kelly, Kelly Doran from uh, University of Toronto, and he's also an architect, um, and we have Chris Magwood with, from Builders for Climate Change in the Rocky Mountain Institute. Next slide. Are we having some difficulties advancing slides or? Uh, so just a little context for what we're talking about today. So the City of Toronto's Climate Change Action Plan uh, is called Transform TO. And uh, in December of last year, our council adopted a net zero 2040 strategy, uh, which is one of the more aggressive climate change strategies in North America. And uh, we have some 2030s targets built into that, uh, including for new construction and some really, you know, a need for aggressive action and accelerated actions in that sector. Next slide. Uh, so the pathway that we have committed to for the new construction sector is that by 2028, we have a near zero emissions requirement for all new private buildings. And you can see that buildings account for the majority of our emissions in the portfolio in Toronto. We have these stepped performance targets out to 2020. In the past, up under that didn't exist for materials. So there's a lot that we can work on to scope to date. Next slide. Um, I'm just going to turn off my video to hope, see if that helps a little bit and we can move things quicker. Uh, so the TGS, that's a tool that we use to implement those requirements around energy and carbon. Um, we have three performance standards for the low rise sector, part nine for mid rise residential and non-residential or part three buildings and a requirement, a separate standard for city owned uh, facilities that we build. And we have a net zero emissions requirement for those city buildings um, starting in 2022. Uh, we have required and voluntary tiers. And we use the voluntary tiers to introduce these new requirements normally to get the industry used to, to new requirements before we put those into the mandatory tier one. 
and we implement the mandatory tier one through our planning approvals process. Next slide. Uh, the Toronto Green Standard version four just came into effect in May 1st. Um, so just wanted to let you know that basically, and it, you can just carry on Ryan, you can just quickly zip through the slides. And it includes the voluntary introduction of upfront materials emissions assessment or tracking. Um, it follows the zero carbon building standard that the CAGBC has developed and uses their templates. So that's for the large part three buildings or follows the beam approach for low rise residential, which I think Chris Magwood will touch on. And in the low rise sector, we did actually set the target like an absolute target of um, needing to meet less than 250 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. And for the large buildings, um, we did set an optional target of a 20% reduction. Um, and for city owned buildings, they must uh, do the full whole building LCA or they can address the 20% reduction target. So what we're doing is trying to undertake this study now, the benchmarking study, to look at how buildings perform in the greater Toronto area to help us set an absolute target for those part three buildings and reassess our target for the low rise sector. Um, and to look at what else we can do uh, in the municipal government to address and reduce embodied um, emissions from materials, from building materials. So um, the first study, the part nine study has already been published that Chris Magwood will speak to. And then the part nine study, we hope to publish that by the end of 2022, I mean, July, 2022, sorry. <laughs> so that's what you're here today to discuss and give us input into uh, primarily, but um, we wanna hear your comments on both the low rise and high rise sector. So with that, I'll pass things over to Ryan Zizzo. Great, thanks Lisa, and apologies for any of those delays. I think yeah, there were some internet issues there. Um, so really happy to be speaking with you all today. Um, Going to just dive right in. I'm going to be giving a bit of an overview on what is embodied carbon and life cycle assessment in case some on the call aren't as familiar um, before heading up, handing it off to Kelly, who will talk about our study results and findings. Um, so when we say embodied carbon, we're, we're really meaning the, the all of the carbon associated with um, the production and operation and end of life of a building, um, all the emissions associated with all of those activities um, combined. So this, this graph does a, or this image does a good job of, of showing that. Um, you can see that the orange is the operational carbon. This is the carbon it takes to run our buildings. This is the carbon that is typically being talked about and regulated and you know, measured and reduced when we talk about energy efficiency or fuel switching or, or things that we have good regulation and policies around. The, all the other part of this image, which you can see is quite a lot, all the blue are the things that are basically being overlooked right now by, by most of the market um, and not really regulated uh, to, to the extent that we, we can. Um, so this is all the embodied carbon, things like material um, harvesting from you know, raw materials, where we're getting them from, um, transportation to manufacturing processes, um, installation processes on, on site, think of all those excavation trucks and diesel powered uh, cranes and, and uh, construction equipment. Um, and then we can talk about the use phase, um, which would include things like materials for replacing of the windows or replacing the roof down the line. You know, all, none of these activities are covered when we look at our energy, you know, our energy meter or our utility bills. Um, also, there's some end of life emissions as well associated with uh, demolition or deconstruction, um, transportation to a final um, a final place like a, a landfill or a recycling facility. So all of those processes have emissions and we can be thoughtful about trying to reduce those and trying to specify materials that require less emissions over this entire life cycle. Um, so this is what we're talking about when we say embodied emissions of construction. Um, this, this figure just shows the total global emissions, um, source of global emissions, and you can see the, the, the red piece of the pie, that's building operations, about 20% of global, 28% of global emissions, but building construction and materials is um, 11, a full 11% of global emissions, which a lot of people don't realize. And when, if we break that down even further, you can see 8% of global emissions are just from cement and concrete. Um, that's 
there, there's only two nations on earth that have more than 8% of global emissions. That's the U.S. and China. So if, cement, if the cement industry was a country, it would be the third most emitting country in the world. Um, so it's, there's a lot of emissions in our, in our concrete and our cement, and there are a lot of things that we can do to reduce that um, without impacting our project schedule or budget. So this is some of the, the key findings of our study. Um, this, this figure just shows the different life cycle phases that we typically would look at in a, in a whole body, a uh, whole building life cycle assessment. Um, and as you start getting more familiar with these types of studies, you'll see folks report their um, uh, results according to, with, with a number code behind it. So you might hear them say A1 to A5. That's referring to these different life cycle stages within the, within the life cycle phase. So A1 to A3 is the actual production phase. It's the raw material supply, transportation, and then manufacturing. And then A4 and A5, that's the transportation from the manufacturer to the actual construction site. A5 is the construction itself. So all of those together is what we call upfront carbon. And that is what, that's the carbon that happens before the building is actually occupied and starting to be used. Um, we have use phase carbon um, with use, maintenance, repair, refurbishment, replacement, and then we have end of life with deconstruction, transport, waste processing, and disposal. So this is the full cradle to grave um, life cycle stages that people would typically be talking about, but wanted to just flag this terminology of upfront carbon means all the carbon that happens up until the building is actually occupied. And this is the carbon that we can actually 100% manage and reduce through, uh, through thoughtful procurement policy. Um, and, and this figure shows why this image is, or why this topic is becoming so important. So the, the top part of the, of the slide, I like to say, this is what buildings of the past uh, looks like, their carbon impact. And this is showing the carbon in the atmosphere cumulatively over a, a typical, say, life, say 60 year lifespan of a building. Um, in year one, before anyone has moved in, you know, the upfront carbon, it's all, it's all embodied carbon has been emitted through the production and construction process, but nothing has been emitted into the atmosphere due to the operation of the building because we, we haven't started operating the building yet. But every year, we're getting a little bit more operating carbon from running, you know, heating, cooling, ventilation, and this is starting to add up over time and it, it surpasses embodied carbon. And by year 60, um, you know, we haven't put any more embodied carbon in the atmosphere or maybe a little bit more from window replacements and things like that. But the operational carbon has grown so much over the past 60 years that it's vastly outweighing embodied carbon. So this is the, the situation we used to be in. And when you see this graph, you think, you know, how, what, what, where do we focus our carbon reduction? And it's obviously on the operating carbon in this, in this case. But this, the, the conditions that led to that are no longer the case, and they're changing rapidly. Um, the two big changes are, one, built new buildings. When we build a new building today, it's much more energy efficient than a building you know, built 10 or 15 years ago. Things like the Toronto Green Standard, the Ontario Building Code, every few years, these are, these are having more and more stringent energy efficiency requirements. So a new building today is much more efficient than, new, than a building you know, years ago that was built. The second thing that's changing this is that our energy system is decarbonizing. So we've you know, phased out coal in Ontario. We are putting up solar, solar farms and wind farms all over the province. So a unit of energy is actually much lower carbon than it used to be. So when we combine both these things together, our buildings are using less energy and the energy they are using is less carbon. It's totally shifted what's, what we're seeing in terms of the split of operating and embodied carbon over the past few years. And now it's something closer to the bottom part of the screen, where you can see oper it's the same trends here, but the operating carbon is increasing at a much smaller, a, a, a much slower rate, and the the relative difference between them are much smaller. And it's no longer a no-brainer to focus on the operating carbon only and ignore the embodied carbon. And it gets even more interesting when we look at shorter timeframes, right? Maybe we should be thinking about the next 10 years instead of the next 60 years. And when you do that shorter timeline, you can see in this blue box here. Um, the embodied carbon is vastly outweighing the, the operating carbon for new construction on this time scale. So this is really showing that our new construction focused policies really needs to be uh, very seriously um, uh, addressing embodied carbon because it's really the biggest piece of our carbon pie over the next decade. Um, so that was kind of illustrative and, you know, in nature, th this is real data. This, we did this analysis from 
uh, with the uh, Ontario government of uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure. This is a LEED certified building uh, that we did this analysis a couple years ago on now. And, it, and the building had already been in operation for a few years. So the orange, the operational data was real data for the first few years. For the first two years and we just extrapolated the same consumption um, over the full life of the building and then we did a whole building life cycle assessment to calculate the blue the embodied carbon and you'll see here that uh it's, it's very significant right it's not a rounding error in the in the in the first 12 years of the building it's, it's the dominant uh it's the main source of energy or um, of emissions and even actually i think it's the break even some somewhere around 40 35 years that's where operational becomes more than embodied um, but the other interesting thing to point out here is the, the red dotted line. That's the embodied carbon of just the concrete. So again, we, there's so much low hanging fruit with our concrete specifications that we can really drive down our, if we focus really on our concrete, it's the, by far the biggest source of these embodied emissions. So that's, that's where we would really like people to start their focus. So something to be aware of is uh, an env environmental product declaration. Um, this is the tool that we use to understand and, and, get, and get some metrics around the embodied carbon of, of the, the uh, construction materials we're specifying. And I like to think of this as a nutritional label. So when you go into a grocery store and you want to buy, uh, buy some food, it's, it's the law that we need to have this nutritional label on the package. Um, but yet we're not, we're not putting the same, um, you know, effort into understanding what we're dumping into our atmosphere when we're producing our, our construction materials. So just like with a nutritional label, when we were, if we were to look at just EPD, this is, this is an example for an EPD from uh, rebar for reinforcing steel for concrete. And you can see there's a whole bunch of metrics on here and a whole bunch of things that can be a little overwhelming when you look at it all at once. But just like a nutritional label, you really need to just focus in on a couple of key metrics here. Um, so one is the serving size on the nutritional label. In an EPD, we call this uh, the declared unit. And in this example, it's one metric ton of re rebar, right? So this, the, the data we're looking at is per ton of rebar. Uh, it's, not, you know, it's not the total package of, of candy, it's, it's the serving size. So just think of, a, think of a nutritional label when you're making those comparisons. And then we want to optimize or reduce for you know, one or two key metrics, maybe total fat, maybe carbs, what, maybe cholesterol. But on an EPD, the thing that I would really point out is the global warming potential. Sometimes this is noted as GWP, um, and that's really the embodied carbon. That's the carbon emissions associated with the product. And you can see here A1, A2, and A3 on the on the far right columns are shown. And, and now you guys know what that means. That's A1 is the you know, where the materials are coming from, the raw extraction. A2 is transportation, transportation to the manufacturer, and then A3 is the uh, manufacturing itself. So hopefully we, uh, you can interpret EPDs a little, a little bit more easily based on that. And one really important thing to, to be aware of is that not all EPDs are created equally. Um, there are industry average EPDs, so where the data is really is North American wide or even or Canada wide. Um, that's where maybe an industry association has paid for this and you know uh, gotten data from all of their members and then done a you know a weighted average for how many members they have in different provinces and then they get they boil that all down to one number and that's their average value for their industry. Um, that's not really that useful for us as designers who want to calculate the carbon footprint of a specific project because we want to know the real products from the real manufacturers we're ordering from, not the industry as a whole. So to do that, we really need what we call facility-specific EPDs, or some people might call it product-specific EPDs. Um, but this is, you know, it, it's the same thing. It's the same type of a document showing the same data, but it's not the industry as an average. It's one specific manufacturer down the, down the street, right? So you can see so the, the EPD on the bottom part of the picture here shows this is a, an EPD for a, a, salt, um, a concrete block made by Permacon at their Milton plant in Ontario, right? So this is a specific product from a specific manufacturer from a specific uh, a plant where they're making this, whereas the ones on the top are, are Canada-wide averages for, for concrete and cement. So, you know, that's a key thing to be aware of when you're looking at EPDs is to understand, is this an industry average or is this a product specific? And we really want to move towards the product specific. I know there's a lot of text on this screen, not going to go through it all, but the point is there's a lot of policy around the world being implemented. Um, that's, some of these have been implemented for years already, but um, embodied carbon policy is, is, is you know, wide, widespread across the world. It's definitely not in every jurisdiction. There's just a handful in Canada now, but it is coming and it's coming quick. So as Lisa said in Toronto, um, all new city city-owned buildings now have to report their embodied carbon. 
same uh, is going to be the case in a few years in Edmonton. They just passed the requirement around that. Um, City of Vancouver requires a 40, or they're, sorry, they're targeting a 40% reduction in new construction of embodied carbon by 2030. And they just, I think last week or two weeks ago, released a new policy that says by 2025, all new construction is going to require um, a 10 or 20% reduction in embodied carbon, depending on the building type. Um, federal government has requirements on this that are being ramped up, and even Waterfront Toronto, um, an agency within the city, um, has their own embodied carbon reporting requirements. Um, I'll just quickly mention it, that in the U.S., they have a policy called Buy Clean, and this has been very effective. Um, it started in California. California has a very advanced Buy Clean policy that says the state will not purchase materials unless it has unless the, those materials come with a facility-specific EPD that shows their carbon footprint is below a certain threshold which they've published. Um, and there's other states following their lead. The federal government in the U.S. is following the lead as well. They're starting to, to implement by clean policies. And even in Canada, um, the recent mandate letters from the prime minister a few months ago um, have, to, have, have asked a number of ministries to start developing a Canada, a by clean Canada policy. So this is very much on, on the agenda of, of these policymakers, and we're going to see a lot more um, policy related to this down, down the road. Just wanted to quickly show a few uh, logos and names for some of the tools that we help that we use to help um, calculate these these things. One click LCA, um, Athena, uh, EC3, Tally. Um, these are all uh, large building, uh, whole building LCA tools. We also have the Beam tool, which Lisa mentioned, and, and Chris will talk a little bit more about. But you know, people don't need to go and do all these estimates from scratch. There are there are. Uh, tools available that streamline a lot of these calculations where we really just need to understand the quantity of materials being used in the building and um, and select those through these materials and kind of combine them and aggregate them. And then the tool has all the background data about the environmental impacts of them all. So I know it sounds it can sound, can sound quite daunting when we describe what we're talking about, but these tools really help folks uh, streamline the assessment. Um, and just wanted to quickly mention the fact that LCA and, and life cycle assessment, embodied carbon assessment, it's not a one-time, uh, it shouldn't be a one-time thing. It's really a tool that can we should be using iteratively throughout the design process because there are different material, there, there are different decisions we can make with the tool at different phases of a life cycle. And I've started to use this language that's aligned with cost estimates. So for example, a class D cost estimate I, I, at schematic at early phase, I, I'm starting to say, let's call that a class D LCA assessment. And we can do, we can have, make decisions about big structural uh, decisions, about massing of the building, about using concrete versus mass timber, about reducing our amount of underground parking. These are the big picture decisions that we can make at early phase at, at design, at, at schematic design. If, as we go into more detailed design and development, maybe we think that think of that as a class C LCA. This is where we start looking at you know actual building layouts and 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 floor plans and the amount of partitions within the structure and all kinds of uh, you know other uh, other details like that that are a little bit more advanced uh, as the design progresses. Maybe when we're at procurement and tender, maybe that's where we can do a class B LCA, and that's when we're going to start talking about the properties of each of our materials, right? How, what's the recycled content of the concrete and the steel we're ordering? What, where, where are the suppliers? What's the transportation, transportation distances involved? So there's a whole, again, you can see there's a whole other series of decisions we can make at this phase of the project, which we wouldn't be able to make at schematic. And, and that shows the value of reiterating our LCA throughout design and, and making new and better decisions at each of these phases. And then maybe at use and occupancy, we could think of a class A LCA. And that uh, we don't have the ability to change the building at this point, but this is really the best in class as built model for the true um, carbon of the project. And this can really help us learn lessons about how far we've come from that class C, right? What was the total change over time? And what kind of lessons can we apply it to future projects? Um, so really quickly, some best practices to reduce embodied carbon. We want to talk about um, we, the first thing is just asking our suppliers for lower carbon options. Um, less volume, less material generally means less carbon. Um, number two, we want to avoid super tall buildings and minimize the below grade construction. Um, I'll let Kelly talk to that in, in the next section. Number three, with concrete, we want to have Portland limestone cement being used, not Portland cement, but Portland limestone cement, which is a 10% carbon reduction right off the bat for no cost impacts or, or schedule impacts. 
We can also maximize our FCMs and consider longer curing times. Most concrete dries in 28 days or cures in 28 days, but we can spread that out for things that don't need early strength, like foundations and walls. They don't, they don't need full strength at 28 days. So if we allow them to cure over a longer time, we can greatly reduce the amount of carbon that is required there because we can use less cement. Um, for steel, we want to use high recycled North American steel. Uh, for wood, we want it to be certified uh, from a forest uh, that it has proper uh, management practices, replanting and, and harvesting practices. And even at the construction site, site, we can start thinking about asking for electric vehicle delivery and construction uh, vehicles where, where possible. They might not be readily available, but we need to start asking so that the demand is there so that in the future they will be available. Um, we can also think about biofuels where possible on the site. So there's a, there's a whole host of things that we can do. And just finally, I wanted to just let folks know, when we are doing these assessments, um, it's typically being limited to structure and envelope currently. That's the best practice uh, by LEED in the CAGBC currently. So just to be aware of that, that there, there are still other materials that are typically not being included in these LCAs, like uh, uh, mechanical and electrical systems, parking lots, uh, excavations. So there is still, still more we need to do to add these eventually over time and have a real true holistic ver uh, uh, vision of the, of the carbon impact so we can reduce it across the whole value chain. So thanks for thanks for listening. I'm going to hand it over to Kelly now. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I'm going to cover, I think, where we are with the, with the study and, and some findings that, uh, of the research that I've been leading at the University of Toronto over the past uh, two years that, that speak to some of the fundamental drivers of it. The, our, our project overview, it's the first, as, as mentioned, the first initiative of its uh, kind in the GTA to be getting whole building uh, life cycle assessments for part three buildings, this in tandem with Chris's part nine, which is coming just up now. Uh, it includes commercial, industrial, institutional, and larger multi-unit housing. So larger, basically everything over 600 square meters and working with uh, you know two of the city's own projects to evaluate how this policy uh, might impact uh, design process. So we'll, we'll be showing you that as well. Next, please. So the summary of the, we got 52 projects back uh, from these, these types. So you can see multi-unit residential under four stories, which is roughly stick frame, mixed use residential uh, over five stories, by and large uh, reinforced concrete frame on those projects commercial office and real estate spaces, and then all other types, which is a kind of range of community centers, uh, warehouses, industrial buildings, et cetera. And I think the one key observation here is that the, the box sets here between the 20th and 8th percentile are pretty tight in, in, as you can see, the amount of buildings that we have underneath it. So of the kind of 10 to 16 buildings, we have a pretty tight data set. And that that data set also corresponds with precedents we've seen elsewhere, like Vancouver, like London, uh, that have done, done similar studies. So we, we feel really good about the data we've received. And I think the other thing just to note is that all those mean averages are less than 500 a meter, which is, a, so I think, a number to keep in the back of your mind for the conversation today. Next. Those emissions, uh, as mentioned, I think just Ryan could have showed it just to bring it home, that the vast majority of 90% of those emissions are related to that product stage, that cradle to gate part of a project. So I think really that needs to be a focus of the policy. And then where that percentage is also broken down by a, by, by a building, you can see it's in the structure, it's in the foundations, the floors uh, and the beams and columns, and then as well, the walls. So the walling being the envelope of the building by and large. This, the city's own project, this is the EMS station by Diamond Schmidt Architects, uh, working with them and, and the city's project management. We took that building, did a whole building life cycle assessment and came back and, and, and with some suggestions of where uh, reductions could be made. And, and here to just uh, illustrate you know, where the key drivers of this project's reductions uh, could be had. So largely looking at XPS, the insulation, paints and coatings in this case, uh, the ready mix, and, uh, and we highlight Blue Lamb and CLT here. The project has a really remarkably low per square meter to, to begin with because it's got a mass timber roof. Next. And so in, in, through this life cycle assessment came back with basically suggested at this point to the specification. So these were not uh, not denominational changes. They wouldn't affect, say, the de the design process at that point. Uh, and where where they were told to, you know, basically we'll check this with our cost estimator and our construction schedule to see if how they impacted. And turned out that they basically said, well, six of your seven suggestions 
are cost negligible and won't impact schedule, we'll incorporate them. And then this resulted in an 800 ton reduction of, of emissions, you know, 26% of, of low hanging fruit there in these late stage specification changes. It was really encouraging. Next. So uh, this builds on some of the research I've been leading at the University of Toronto. So two years ago, I, 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 I reached out to a host of firms wanting to basically ask the question, well, we need to set targets in the city. We need to half our reductions this decade. And the, and the simple question is half of what, right? Because that's kind of the background of the half studio. So uh, the first year we looked at multi-unit residential in Toronto, given it's such a large percentage of total floor area being built. And the projects were either recently completed or in construction. So you can see here the range from the small townhouses up to a 66 story tower, 66 story tower there at Levin Wellesley. The summary of those results here, um, you can see that the stick frame uh, buildings at the top there, these townhouses on average 250 uh, a square meter. Uh, then the mid rise and high rise were all relatively around, they, they average around that 400, 488 straight to 500 mark. And there's a big, big variation within them, though, that really uh, that we'll get into what, what's driving some of these uh, numbers to be so low or so high. Next, please. So the first key driver, as mentioned, this, the, 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 the third country of concrete, uh, reinforced concrete was the largest single driver of emissions across all the projects. The low rise projects that employed that stick frame, as you've seen, you know, roughly half that of the concrete structures on a square meter basis. So I think that's a, a real interesting thing to hold if you think about the new policies coming out of the city around multiplexes to encourage uh, lower rise, higher density forms of development. The lowest carbon mid rise project employed steel on hollow core structural system, uh, which would, uh, resulted in dramatic reductions of the total volume of concrete. So this that project going to hollow core kind of technology we've somewhat left behind really may be worth revisiting. Next. So here, just to represent all the projects, the radius of these circles, total emissions, and then you can see the percentage of concrete, you know, being be the majority of the overall emissions, but then next closely behind it is both aluminum and insulation, which is really, yes, next please, in the envelope. So I'm an architect, this is kind of where all our agency really sits, um, that our envelope systems, you know, fairly uniformly right now, incredibly high embodied carbon. And that's because we've been using historically a lot of insulation, specifically things like XPS, which can come with incredibly high embodied carbon and aluminum extrusion based glazing systems in Toronto. That's, you know, window wall, curtain wall, aluminum framed windows, uh, things that have aluminum carry the highest embodied global warming potential by volume of all building materials. <coughs> Excuse me. So here is looking at some of the envelopes. So on the right, the window wall, so you can see it's roughly twice the twice the embodied carbon of these other wall systems. And also, you know, excuse me. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Also, the R value significantly less. You know, an R value of two compared to an R value of twenty-seven. So, twice the embodied carbon and a fraction of the R value with these these walls. So, begs the question: Should we continue uh, to employ them? Next, please. A third driver, and I think this is where it gets really interesting with this conversation today, with the planning community and say some of the unintended consequences of our planning laws. <coughs> Sorry, I a bit of a cold. Um, foundation works, parking structures, below grade floor area, basements, have disproportionate impacts on a project's embodied carbon. For mid-rise and high-rise structures, between 20 to 50% of a project's total volume of concrete was below grade. So to illustrate this here, next slide, even in these stick frame buildings, you can see that the majority of a project's uh, emissions were even due to these little half basements that because of the concrete foundations wrapped in XBS insulation. Uh, on the far right, that has an underground parking garage. Next, at the mid rise and high rise, it's, it's a, there's a pretty big difference here. And I'll call out 22 Trolley Crescent is, is River City down by the, the Don, uh, by the, the mouth of the Don. So they could not go down because of flood issues. You can see as a percentage then the overall building is much lower and compared to immediately next to it on the junction built on top of an old water course, 50% of its total emissions related to the two floors of underground parking. So <clears throat> many of the cases here, I think the thing to think about is at one point, certainly I know that the city has now gotten rid of minimum parking requirements, but up until then, 
parking requirements inherently we're forcing development into the ground because basically anything below grade in our current building codes and, and planning law, you can, you can go to the center of the earth's core in Toronto if you want to. Uh, and that has a, a huge impact here, as you can see. So aside from the minimum parking impact driving you into the ground, it also has another effect, which is the dimensional impact of parking spaces on a structural grid of, of a project. So that the spacing of a parking space is not necessarily the same as the structure above it housing the residential. And to illustrate that, next slide. Oh, sorry, uh, here we go. You can see in red, the, the floor plan of the residential units, this uh, TCHC project, and the black, the grid of the parking below, which to reconcile these two things, you get these very large transfer structures happening. In this case, a meter deep, thick concrete floor, the entire ground floor, simply to accommodate two floors of parking below grade. That's certainly not a practice we should be continuing, I would say. Next. <clears throat> this year, we wanted to kind of look at mass timber as a counterpoint. You know, I think there's a lot of promise and, and interest in mass timber as a sustainable form of construction moving forward. So if concrete was roughly 500, you know, what was mass timber? Next, please. So again, went out to the architectural community, uh, got some projects from Toronto, but also further afield out, out west in Washington, in, in Oregon. Uh, in the UK and in, and in Sweden to find examples of either completed or, or in progress mass timber projects. And, and the results here are kind of interesting that, you know, most of these projects are commercial or institutional, not a lot of housing yet in mass timber, but as, a, as an average, you can see that 443, it's about 90%, you know, and if you think about housing, it's got a lot more walling. I think by and large, the upfront emissions right now in mass timber are not consequentially different than the concrete ones. Next, please. <clears throat> and and there's not quite an apples to, to, to apples comparison here, though, because I think the one thing about mass timber is the biogenic storage capacity of wood, and i.e. the sequestration. So you can see two projects here that had the same per square meter uh, footprint, but the one on the right, the Catalyst project, had far more wood per square meter in it. So are these buildings the same? Should what? How should would be? How should we be uh, governing these? For for instance, next. Also, where wood comes from is a big. Uh, matter of importance. So some of the projects here, you can see that the radius of the transport of, of, of the wood's travel time from say, in this case, the wood academic tower in Toronto being sourced from Northern Alberta, um, a big difference in the total emissions of those projects. Next, please. And those emissions also, I think a critical thing, if there's one thing to take away from my, my portion today is that your geography is crucially important. I think those slides that Ryan showed, uh, you know, I'll, I'll show you in a second here about the operational trade-off with the embodied has a lot to do with the grid you sit on. Also, where your materials come from have a lot to do with the grid they sit on. So for instance, if a tree was cut, you know, in British Columbia and had the option to go down here to Washington State or over to Alberta to be sawn and dried, I would take the one in Washington state. It's not the same tree anymore. It's, 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 it's got a much lower embodied carbon because of the grid that that sawmill and processing sits upon. Next, please. And here you can see then, you know, the same house built in two parts of Canada right now, that Albertan grid that on that day in May was, you know, roughly 20 times more grid, uh, more emissions per kilowatt hour than Toronto. And so I think again, in the context of the GTA, as long as our, our grid stays green, let's hope, uh, this is the conversation, I think, in Alberta, it's, it's slightly different. Next. <clears throat> so the next steps we've got here, so our, we're drafting our, our recommendations to the City Advisory Committee, you know, wrapping up the summer. This is the last of the workshops you can see here today. Uh, we're going to be taking everything we hear back to put into these primer uh, in the next month. And then uh, final final workshop with the with our recommendations of July. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, switching over from uh, the part three study of the larger buildings to the part nine study that uh, that my team and I uh, led last year, where we looked at a sample set of 503 as built homes in the GTHA. And this slide is a little bit of a, uh, a breakdown of <clears throat> uh, where those homes were in the region and what type of homes they were. So we essentially analyzed 59 sets of <clears throat> unique plans, which then represented uh, the 503 uh, as-built homes in the region uh, 
uh, over the last couple of years. Okay, next please. So similar to what uh, Kelly and Ryan discussed before me, um, we sort of you know put a, a frame around the materials that we include in these studies. And so for uh, this part nine study of, uh, of smaller residential buildings, we are looking at all the materials required to make the structure, enclosure, and partitions for those buildings. Um, for a few reasons, that's where uh, the, the, the bulk of the materials uh, are used in terms of mass. It's also the set of materials for which we both have uh, a really good data set and for which there are really good options and opportunities for choosing low carbon uh, materials. <clears throat> but what's currently excluded are things like uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing materials, uh, fixtures and appliances, stairs, millwork, cabinetry, and uh, exterior sort of yard works like, uh, like driveways and porches. So for this study, we used a tool. It's been referenced a couple of times. It's called BEAM, and it's specifically set up to estimate those uh, structure, enclosure, and partition uh, emissions for low-rise buildings. And what we found in the GTHA, uh, if we looked at total emissions for, um, for all of the buildings, was an average uh, of just under 43 tons of emissions per house. But you can see by the results here that um, depending on the type of house, whether it was a semi, uh, a single detached or a townhouse, uh, that would vary. And that varied because of the, the sizes of the units. Obviously, if you build a, a smaller unit, which townhouses tend to be, they're likely to have a lower overall carbon footprint than uh, a larger single detached. Okay, next please. So what that means uh, on an average basis for the region um, is that if it's about 42.9 tons per house and with the number of houses of this type that are, are built in the region every year, it's uh, just under a million tons of emissions per year, 840,000, which is the same as the, the tailpipe emissions from 183,000 cars. But when we sort of uh, did a, a sensitivity study to, you know, adding the materials that we didn't include, there's a pretty good chance that a year's worth of, of low rise construction in this region uh, is in the neighborhood of 1.75 million tons of emissions uh, if we were capturing uh, all of the materials. So this is a, a sizable pool of emissions. That's one thing that this study uh, really helped confirm is that is that you know, it's, it, it becomes one of the, the leading um, sources of emissions uh, in the region. Okay, next. So we did look at, at emissions for, you know, total emissions for each house, but more, I think, interesting and, and useful, both um, as, a, as a discussion point, but also for regulators to think about is emission intensity by area. We call it MCI, material carbon intensity. And when we look at it through uh, that lens, if we are picking uh, heated area as the as the uh, as the area to use, then the average home in the GTHA uh, has 191 kilograms of emissions per square meter of heated floor area, and you can see that uh, by heated area, you know again that 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 uh, that box plot is pretty tight, and you know the vast majority of the homes kind of came in between. 152 and 224 kilograms uh, of emissions per square meter. So that's uh, that's a really you know tight grouping uh, of a large sample and gives us a, a pretty good sense that you know that the average there is an average and that it, it lies in that sort of like 190 ish range for for this region. Okay. So just to kind of you know summarize that <clears throat> emissions intensity by heated floor area, we had a, a best result of 116 kilograms. Uh, of emissions per square meter. We had a worst case scenario of uh, 561. And again, the average was, was 191. So, um, you know, as we start to think about that um, for um, possible regulation, that, that average number, uh, I think is a, is a good thing to, to be keeping in mind. We also looked at where those impacts were coming from and uh, you know, maps pretty closely to the large building study here. Uh, concrete was the, the largest driver uh, across all the homes. So if we looked at, at, at all the emissions of all the homes, uh, concrete represented 33% uh, of all those emissions. Uh, 
insulation just behind that at 26.1 and then cladding so the sort of exterior um, cladding of the building uh, at 12.8 and you can see the, the other areas like in, interior surfaces drywall flooring and ceilings is lower windows is smaller and the, the, the other categories you know start to really dwindle in comparison to uh, to these three so as with the, the large building study, one of the things that we wanted to do was look at, you know, what kind of reductions are possible when we're looking at, at part nine homes. So we took one of the sample buildings, um, its emissions are there, the red column. So it had uh, 81 tons of emissions uh, overall for that house and a, an intensity of 262 kilograms uh, per square meter. So it was, you know, one of the, the higher intensity homes. And then we use the beam tool to basically start making some substitutions in those materials to see where we could get that home to. So we did things like, what if you use the best available concrete mix? What if you swapped out uh, some of your insulation materials? Uh, that's the next two bars. What if you swapped out the, the, uh, the brick cladding? And what if you chose the, the flooring and the drywall um, that are sort of the, the lowest emission versions of those products in their categories? And with those, you know, five different substitutions, we saw a 75% reduction in the carbon footprint of the materials for that home. So uh, when Ryan mentioned that there's a lot of low hanging fruit, uh, I think in particular in the, the low rise part nine buildings, there is a huge amount of, of low hanging fruit. Uh, those material substitutions uh, that we did there um, are not, you know, more difficult or more expensive or anything like that. Um, so it, it sort of points to the fact that um, this is an area where, where we really could drive some substantial emission reductions uh, in fairly short order. Okay, next. So another interesting thing that we did was we performed the same material substitutions on, uh, on a home that had a much better, uh, lower carbon footprint to start with. So instead of 81 tons of emissions, it only had 33. So that's the little orange bar that's lined up there. We went through the exact same set of material substitutions and we ended up uh, with that building um, uh, ending up at 56.5 kilograms per square meter. Whereas the one that started really bad and went through the same material substitutions ended up at 66. So what that sort of says to us is that you know, there is a, a suite of materials or, or a bunch of approaches that could be used to, um, to drive emissions down on these buildings. And what happens is, regardless of the building, uh, whether it's, you know, a town or a single or a semi, uh, regardless of its design, we can actually drive it down to about the same fairly low number of emissions fairly easily. So um, really interesting sort of food for thought for people who are thinking about, um, you know, how we might want to regulate that. And I'll just quickly show you here that these results for the GTHA, um, how they track to other studies that Builders for Climate Action has done across the country. Um, we did a, a white paper a few years ago. Um, oh, sorry. Um, we did a large study for Enercan looking at 190 homes across the country. And we did a, a study of uh, 34 as built homes for Nelson and Castlegar. And you can see the worst results you know, line up anywhere from sort of 309 up to 561 kilograms of emissions. The average falls pretty closely uh, all the way uh, across the country. Um, it's a bit higher in the GTHA, mostly because of having uh, the ubiquity of large garages and brick cladding and XPS insulation. Um, and you can see that we also had some encouragingly uh, low results and outstanding results uh, in some of these studies as well to kind of show that, that there is a lot of possibility to, uh, to really drive some dramatic change in reductions here. Hey Chris, sorry to interrupt and we're gonna take more questions later, but we got that question we love and I think you should answer it right now about <laughs> costing and availability. Sure, um, so though if you wanna uh, jump back to the sort of comparison or the reduction slide, then Ryan, it might be easier to uh, sort of do, yeah. So in this case, we, we specifically made substitutions that were either the same cost or lower in cost or had no cost impact and that were using materials that were widely available in the region and are fully code compliant. So, um, you know, obviously there's a bunch of materials being substituted here. 
but overall, um, you know, our assessment was that there would be no substantial change to the cost of making uh, either the, the, the existing house as it was or this uh, improved lower carbon version. So thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to address that. And if you, if you check out the study, you know, we go into more detail uh, on costing. So I think I just want to point out um, the two studies we've done of, of actual as-built homes really show some, I think, um, encouraging uh, possibilities for uh, regulation because here in the GTHA, there is a builder out there, the, the, the builder whose homes were responsible for the lowest emissions, that 116 kilograms uh, of emissions per square meter, who's beating the average by almost 40% without attempting to make a low embodied carbon home. So that's, you know, that's that, that developer's business as usual model. Uh, I think that also goes to sort of addressing some of the cost concerns. You know, they aren't, they aren't high-end homes. They're, they're very typical, you know, moderately priced uh, production homes. Um, but just their business as usual practice is already 40% under what the average is. And the same, you know, we saw the same thing uh, out in Nelson in a different market where uh, another sort of typical builder making a typical home uh, by their best, uh, you know, best practices uh, is beating the average by 50%. And again, not attempting to make a low carbon home. So I think, you know, those results really point to the fact that uh, it, it, it shouldn't be very hard to reduce these embodied carbon emissions in, in the part nine buildings by 40 to 50% because there are already builders uh, achieving that without uh, without them even realizing or or attempting to uh, to reduce their carbon footprint. Okay, next. So um, out of our report, we sort of um, gave some uh, some thoughts on on uh, incentive or policy guidance. Uh, the first step would be uh, to simply require material carbon emissions reporting. Uh, there are two free tools available in Canada now that are specifically aimed at this part nine market. Uh, BEAM, which is the one that uh, was used in this study and developed by Builders for Climate Action, and MCE Squared, which is Enercan's tool. Uh, the two share uh, a, a, a sort of the same kind of uh, database and platform and methodology. Um, MCE Squared uh, connects to the HOT 2000 um, energy modeling software. So if somebody's already making a, a model for uh, for energy requirements, um, it's easy to make this. Um, whoops, sorry, I just lost. There we go. Um, setting caps, I think, is is something to start thinking about. Uh, Lisa mentioned that the the TGS for uh, Part Nine buildings uh, had a 250 kilogram of emissions per cap for heated floor area. Uh, I think that's it's great to see that in there. Um, as this study shows, you know, 150, I think, is easily attainable and, and 100 to 115 is being achieved by some builders already. So I think there's room to uh, be, uh, you know, ambitious, uh, at least at, at the incentive level with those kind of targets. Um, and, and one sort of piece of food for thought is, you know, thinking about uh, the metrics. We're kind of talking in uh, material carbon intensity of a certain number of kilograms of emissions per square meter of heated floor area. Um, but it would be good to think about, you know, does that work with other things that your municipality might be trying to achieve around uh, density or affordability or other things like that. So um, we kind of have the, the, in an area like this where there is no policy yet, uh, we have a chance to, you know, make sure that, that the, the kind of guidance you might provide around um, embodied carbon emissions uh, to align with other priorities in, uh, in your policies. Okay, next. So our overall recommendations from the study was that uh, all new home designs undertake some material carbon emissions calculations um, at the early design phase and, and you know, submit that report uh, at the permit phase that uh, builders and designers uh, request EPDs from manufacturers. So the, the as Ryan said early on, like the more the more EPDs we have that are product uh, specific, the better the resolution of this data. Um, we can explore some immediate potential for those material substitutions. You know, we showed that sort of forty to fifty percent is possible. Seventy-five percent is uh, is even achievable. Um, but to think, if you if you go read the Part Nine report, there's a lot more about 
future material substitutions where where we could be going um, if uh, you know if we kind of steer builders in the right direction there's actually the potential in the part nine sector uh, to achieve 100 percent reductions to make this uh, this category of buildings uh, carbon neutral I think fairly quickly um, and uh, you know for for people to really uh, start thinking about these material carbon emissions and I know some of the the, uh, the developers involved with our study are you know starting to publish those numbers and use them in their marketing material and uh, and I think that's a, a really great direction and so yeah that's it for the part nine study and uh, okay yeah thanks Chris that was great um, so we're going to take a short break now. We were hoping to have Sean Pender from the city of Vancouver join, but he was um, he's at a conference right now. He said he would call in for us. But uh, Matt, maybe you can just let me know. Maybe you can just uh, let us know if he joins, and um, we can take a few questions now, maybe, and hopefully he'll he'll be able to join us. Um, so if anyone, yeah, we can we can maybe just start the discussion section and if and if uh, Sean joins we can just uh, pause and, and let it hear hear his uh, perspectives from Vancouver um, but we th th this part of part of the session is really for uh, you all to ask questions and to provide any insights or, or thoughts that you might have um, we have some points at the bottom of the screen there which could help guide the discussion um, about your experience with embodied carbon on past projects anything that you found interesting or um, some, anything that you want to you want to chat through, and um, if you have any thoughts on on um, resources or how we can roll out policies like this most effectively. But I did just get a note that I think Sean just joined us. So John, Sean, if you're there, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts on Vancouver's perspective with embodied carbon um, over the past few years, and and how what you, what kind of uh, response you got from the industry, and, and anything else you'd, you'd like to share for us. We've got about five minutes. Left. Thanks so much, Ryan. It's uh, Sean Pander here with the City of Vancouver. Can you guys hear me clearly? Yep, we can hear you great, Sean. Thanks. Great. Yeah. So, you know, um, Vancouver, you know, with our charter authority to regulate buildings, you know, we've been actively regulating the operational emissions from buildings for a number of years. And, you know, by 2025, they're going to be virtually zero. Uh, that coupled with newly introduced regulations for operational emissions really led us to understand that, you know, a new building built in Vancouver sort of by 2025, the embodied carbon emissions will be an order of magnitude bigger than the operational emissions over its entire lifespan. And of course, those embodied carbon emissions happen uh, right at the outset. So as uh, as a nation, as, as different cities and society move to those low operating uh, emissions very rapidly, embodied carbon becomes such a significant portion of the problem. And what we have been doing in Vancouver, starting in 2017, we started to require um, energy models with new developments. So, you know, or not energy, but embodied carbon models. And so we started to accumulate some data on like different building approaches and what is the embodied carbon implications of that. Um, and uh, we've been gathering that data with the intent to start to regulate embodied carbon. Council gave us the direction to uh, look to reduce embodied carbon associated with new construction by 40% by 2030. So that's a, an active target my group is working on. And two weeks ago, Council approved the first regulation. So again, we control our building code. So um, by starting in uh, June of next year, we will have a reference building. So that uh, embodied carbon modeling will have to be in comparison to a reference building to kind of give us the standardized frame uh, of reference to like, oh, how good is this relative to a, uh, a building of its type? Uh, but that really lays the groundwork for the other regulation that council approved was that by 2025 projects, depending on the type of project, have to reduce versus that reference building by between 10 and 20 percent. And so, you know, we're really now on this path and we see, you know, great interest from other levels of government. 
uh, where because carbon is such a critical issue of our time, uh, and you know, as regulators, we need to we need to address the embodied carbon, given how significant it is, uh, as we are are making great progress on the operational emissions. So I, I think you know what you see happening, or what what I'm con- conveying as happening in Vancouver, I think is just you know sort of we're well, hopefully not the canary in the coal mine because I don't want to end up dead because of this. But I, I think you're seeing that early signaling that this is a real thing and and it is coming. So we uh, collectively need to start working to uh, you know upscale uh, our our ability to address these embodied carbon through industry and and through government. Great, thank you so much for sharing that, Sean. Um, so yeah, lots of really great lessons can be learned from from Sean's team and the experience in Vancouver, and we're really. Um, I, I, working with the City of Toronto and, and Olisa, uh, we've been inspired by Sean's work and we're, uh, we're nipping at their heels to uh, implement some strong embodied carbon policies here as well. So we're, we're, we're launching a friendly competition between <laughs> Vancouver and Toronto to put, see who, who can go the furthest, the fastest on these embodied carbon policies. Um, so Sean, feel free to jump off if, if you need to go. I know you're at a conference and thank you for taking the time, but if you're able to stick on, please do. Um, we'll open it up to discussion now, um, though, but I just wanted to wrap up uh, what we heard, some of the key things we heard. Um, I, I, I just made a list here, some of the really great things that came out of this discussion is um, easy to use data on like embodied carbon per kilogram, per kilometer of infrastructure, for example, um, embodied carbon 101 policy primer, uh, legal opinion on implementing this in Ontario municipalities, list of material substitutions to propose, um, data material, sorry, a database of materials or suppliers that have low carbon uh, materials or, or that meet specific targets like recycling um, amounts, guidance on early phase versus late, late phase LCAs, what those should look like, and moving towards the standard um, in the whole building LCA phase. So um, these are all really great recommendations that um, I don't think came up in our other workshops. So there's lots lots on this topic from different audiences. So that's why we were kind of having these dedicated um, audience discussions and really happy that you guys all share that with us. Um, yeah, Kelly. Well, I, I think, Saad, you make a great point here. And I think this is something that is totally in control of people on the city side. If a developer came to you and said, instead of you know four floors of below grade parking, I want to put it above grade, would you allow me to have four extra floors, right? And if, if, the, if, if the math and the kind of costs were shown to you, it's a cheaper build for the developer, for sure. Above grade floor area is gonna be a lot cheaper. It's also a floor area that can be converted from parking to housing or some other use in the future. Um, and, and it will be lower embodied carbon. And so the question would be, would you allow four more floors, right? For the pro forma. And I think this is where the city, this is where I think the conversation really can go once you're informed with that kind of analysis, uh, because ultimately it's a better building and it's lower carbon. And considering that basements are a provincial domain, uh, we just had provincial elections. Yeah. Uh, this government has promised you six stories anywhere where a bus passes by. And uh, if it's gonna be built on a main road with a bus, obviously the whole main floor would have to be parking and the rest of the five floors could be residences. So I think there's a real appetite. It's just that how can we propose it from a city side where we show that we don't like basements, but we would incentive, you know, trade one floor away to the bottom to the top. Thanks for the, the thought. It's great. I think you guys have a lot to discuss offline. Uh, yeah. We're going to have to wrap up this session. Really appreciate all the thoughts from everyone and um, stay engaged. We have another workshop in July where we're going to be sharing the primer. And as you see, there's a lot more to discuss. This is the start, not the end of the discussion. Um, and we have now some good benchmarking data that you can all go to your councils with and say, you know, we let's start setting some targets and some numbers here. So thank you all. And uh, we look forward to staying connected with you. We'll share, we'll share the links and slides and everything uh, next week.